rather than talking about schooling system here, private sector over there, non-profit sector over there, really we need to think of the learning ecosystem. Everyone has a role to play. Technology is a tool, um, although it's called artificial intelligence, it was built by humans. Uh, and so it's in our hands to uh, forge this better, brighter future of learning. Historically, when you look at the proliferation of these technologies and the access question, it's typically come from private enterprise. Welcome to this special episode of the Doha Debates podcast in association with the Wise On Air podcast series. I'm Rawa Oje and I will be your moderator for this conversation here at the Wise 11 Summit. In our regular episodes of the Doha Debates podcast, we explore an urgent issue from various sides and try to find common grounds. Today we're discussing artificial intelligence in the world of education. We know that AI is already in the classroom. Students regularly use it to help with or even write papers and other schoolwork. In a previous episode, we discussed whether using AI like this was cheating. I think it depends on how you use it. You can check out that episode with Sal Khan from Khan Academy and technology reporter Jacob Ward on the Doha Debates YouTube channel. Today, we're talking specifically about access. How can we ensure that all learners benefit from this technology? And who is best placed to deliver it to them? Is it educational institutes? Is it businesses? Is there a way to cut out the middlemen and middlewomen and give students direct control over the implementation of these tools? And as always in these debates, we will be bringing in a question a little later from a student somewhere around the world to see what they have to say about all of this. We're also asking how to ensure that the technology itself doesn't deepen existing inequalities between learner, educational communities, and even countries. So who is best placed to deliver the benefits of AI to learners and to ensure that these advantages are available to everyone? To debate this question, we're joined by three global education experts. We have with us Nadim Natu. He is the founder of the Knowledge Society. Isabel Ho. She is, the exec- uh, she is the executive director of the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. Luca Pari, who is the CEO and founder of the Learning Future. Isabel, let's start with you. You're based at the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. Can you tell us about the work you do there and why you think education institutions like yours are well placed to deliver the benefits of AI to learners? Thank you. Stanford University has been at the center of all of us for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And today we are doing extraordinary work bringing all faculty across education, computer science, neuroscience, business, and more humanities, psych, for sure, uh, many areas of the university to bring um, new solutions that are connected to research, um, leveraging AI technologies. And so this is why you think you are the best institution to deliver this uh, to learners? Well, so let me actually step back one second on uh, on um, your question earlier um, about who should be involved in this um, evolution of artificial intelligence. And I would make the strong case that uh, in addition to big tech companies, we need two uh, other constituents, which are academy, academics research as well as uh, educators. Nadim, you started your company, the Knowledge Society, with the idea of helping talented young people excel. What makes your business model or any business model most suitable for delivering AI to future CEOs and scientists? Well, to give you some context, the reason why we started TKS is we wanted to build an education institution that specifically trained people, especially young people, to solve important problems in the world using emerging technologies and sciences, so things like AI, quantum, nanotech, gene editing, stem cells, blockchain. But the reason why we felt like we had to do it is because there was a massive lag within the education system, especially talking about these technologies, let alone building and developing a portfolio. So at TKS, we take a student, 13, 14, 15 years old, who doesn't even know how to code. And they're not child geniuses, I promise you. By the end of 10 months, students are completing master's PhD level projects. The youngest employees today at SpaceX, NASA, Tesla, OpenAI, DeepMind, Microsoft, IBM are all TKS students as young as 15. And our alumni in the last two years have raised around 100 million bucks to start venture-backed companies and nuclear-powered chips, AI and batteries, blockchain infrastructure, all that stuff. So I don't necessarily think TKS 
is the answer to this specific question. But the reason why I share this is because it highlights the lag in the current system. And to actually take a step back to answer your question, I think I can answer the question by asking a question in a different way. Imagine this was 20 years ago. And instead of AI, substitute AI for search, like Google search mm -hmm. or the internet. And say this was 15 years, years ago and you substitute mobile for AI. And say this was 10 years ago, we substituted apps. And then let's say this the same question was about skills. So coding or financial literacy or digital literacy. I can tell you historically who it's not, who isn't the answer. And the answer historically is not the education system. Even from a distribution channel perspective, it's not the education system. We've been talking about getting coding in schools, especially K to 12 for a very long period of time. And it's still very difficult to do that. One last point that I'll mention is every step of these technologies that we were talking about, there was always resistance from the current education system. So when search came out, a similar thing that was happening with ChatGPT right now was, oh, this is going to be the end of exams. Everyone's going to cheat. When mobile came out, schools were like, put away your phones, mm -hmm. right? When there's other tools that were coming out to learn, it's like, you know, we're not going to encourage these things. And of course, when ChatGPT came out, but when you look at businesses, as soon as Google came out, businesses were like, how do we figure out how to use this? Mobile, how do we figure out how to use this? ChatGPT, how do we figure out how to use this? And I think most applications that end up figuring out how to deliver meaningful value will probably come, I would say 80% from the private sector, 27% maybe from a nonprofit sector like Code Academy or Khan Academy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's just no historical evidence for me to suggest, unless we have other data points here, that a lot of the democratization of these tools are going to come from the education system. But would the private businesses be, um, be able to commit to actually providing uh, this uh, this content, this knowledge, uh, fairly to all students, uh, give access fairly to every student? Well, let's use some examples. Does every, Say you want to learn a language, right? And let's assume Duolingo is good. We can debate whether it's a good or no. bad way to learn a language, but can most people who have a device and 3G internet access Duolingo? I would say so. ChatGPT right now, if you have a device and 3G internet, can you access ChatGPT? ChatGPT, I mean, it's oh, people use the joke, right? Open AI, but it's actually closed AI, for-profit institution, whatever. Um, but the, the reason why they are proliferating all these things is because they want as many people to use it as possible. Internet. Who were the people responsible for proliferating internet around the world? Well, Google.org, you know, Facebook's initiative, but now Starlink. Not necessarily governments or anything like that. The reason why they do that, and Google and Facebook had an incentive to make sure everyone was using the internet is because that was their next growth vector. The only way they could make more money is if more people had access to internet. So I actually think that there are built-in incentives. Of course, you need great leadership. You need conscious leadership. You need people, you know, and, and I think regulatory bodies and all that stuff will definitely be there to make sure that these tools aren't being used in a malicious way, mm -hmm. but especially where the incentives are aligned and what we've seen in the past, it does seem to be the case. And I, I, I agree that there is some um, contributions to be had from the not-for-profit sector, which I cited two examples, like Code Academy and Khan Academy. But historically, when you look at the proliferation of these technologies and the access question, it's typically come from private enterprise. Luca, you believe that although learners can control the design and the building of these AI products, you say they can control how the technology is deployed and used in the classroom. So are learners themselves best placed to harness AI for education? I think what's really interesting, I mean, I've enjoyed the comments so far. Um, my reflection is when we start talking about education, we need to make a few distinctions. The, the distinction between schooling mm -hmm. and education and perhaps between learning as well as three different constructs because otherwise we'll conflate all of them. Learning to me is a fundamental human trait that actually is how we all find our own authentic selfhood. Um, but when we come to the idea of an education system, and I mean, I agree with you, Nadim, on some of your commentary, um, to think about what kind of education system we're talking about and... For example, as an educator myself, like even the terms like users is not, are not a term that I think really elevates the lived experience of people that are in these communities, be they teachers, school leaders, community members, or the learners themselves. So rather than being a user of my product, that to me seems so power over and seems like I am delivering to you to consume, although be it a generative technology that might help transform an experience and build a capability, I'm far more interested in how we have a transformative 
approach, a transformative paradigm to the way that we co-design. So for example, what we see, rather than talking about schooling system here, private sector over there, non-profit sector over there, really we need to think of the learning ecosystem. Everyone has a role to play. Yes, education systems are not good, I would say, at innovating within themselves for a whole range of reasons, largely because they're tied into the political economy in particular with its short-term cycles, which is problematic in democratic systems. Um, but similarly, I think my, my reflection on the private sector is that you can have phenomenal innovation taking place, but also uh, the incentives aren't always aligned in service of human flourishing. And if the theme of this beautiful convening that we're at, you know, human flourishing in AI era, you know, I think we need to be very careful about just, quote, moving fast and breaking things, end quote, which was, of course, the mantra for Facebook as part of the social media revolution. Well, there is a huge amount of peer-reviewed evidence now that shows that social media has probably had a net negative impact on human cognition, on mental health, on social cohesion, on fake news and discernment. And so I think, I think we need to think about these things as an ecosystem, and we need to think about how each particular player can, can most powerfully contribute to that. And I think no single player is best placed. You know, we all have to kind of come together um, to be able to design well the, uh, the future of, of these tools and, and the deployment of them, right? Just, just to ask you a question. Yeah. I totally agree with every single thing that you said. So there's no point of disagreement there. It sounds like the question that you were answering was the who should versus who will. Mm. So in, in terms of who should, of course, if we were talking about collaboration and ecosystem approach, I mean, universities and Stanford is in a class of its own, right? For sure. But if you look about most post-secondary edu education institutions, they're not necessarily collaborating with industry to figure out how to revamp their curriculums and things like that. So of course we would want those things. The reality is, is we're not seeing it, right? And so, you know, if we go back to the question of like, who will democratize access to some of these tools? Let's assume that tools are positive and then we can do the same thing. Obviously if the tools are negative, we don't want to democratize those things. Mm -hmm. But if the tools help learners, as an example, and if we're talking about it in the context of education or teachers or educators, whatever the case it is, who is best positioned? Do you have a perspective on how you think that will actually happen? Allow me, allow me to step in. There's, there is democratization of all these uh, tools. Uh, I'm going to, to mention an example from my son. He's five years, he was five years old when they had to come back to school. Mm. And uh, the next day he came back and saying, why should I go to school? I know more things than the teacher from podcast. And I asked yeah. Siri how many volcanoes they are. He knew the answer, whereas my teacher didn't know the, ent the answer. Yeah. So I had to invent uh, for him a utility of the school system that it's a place just to uh, socialize, to learn social skills and so on. So there is democratization, like uh, Nadim is saying. But there is this distinct three sectors in education that we need to think about. And uh, how can we use AI for this generation that is already using it? They're, they're already at Absolutely. it. So how can we catch up and make sure that this child can learn a lot of things, but can actually vet what he's learning, can actually uh, uh, realize when, he's, uh, uh, when the AI is giving him the right answers or not? I leave it. Is that yeah, I, I was going to uh, uh, first make a comment and uh, slightly disagree with my friend Nadim here um, on uh, one big concern that I have. And um, we, we have great partnerships at Stanford with Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, all these big tech companies. As a matter of fact, that contributed to the recent OpenAI teaching, teaching with AI um, uh, publications that they, they came up with recently. So just as an example. Um, I was in a meeting, this was uh, in May, all day meeting with Google. Uh, we had about 50 engineers from Google and 50 people from Stanford on computer science. The whole day, and so the topic was AI, not AI and education, let me come back to that. Um, we spent the whole day, not one word on education. There were some discussions on health, there were some other discussions, but education was not even mentioned. We arrived toward the end of the day, and there is a session on moonshots, and uh, I'm sitting at a table similar to this one, and uh, we came up with, okay, well, one of the moonshots could be education. And I, I was like, yeah, this is very interesting. So both 
engineers who are very well intentioned are working on these big problems that are tech oriented, they are not thinking about education. Mm. Which is why I think so strongly that we need to have researchers, we, have, we need to have educators at the table in designing those new solutions. Why they're not thinking about education? So there are, I think there are two, 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 there are several problems. One of them is monetization. So if you think about the size of, you know, market um, and from a for-profit perspective, you think about marketing, you think about other sectors that are not education related. Uh, the second thing is that it hasn't been for some of those companies, they have other priorities, but education is complicated. Education is complicated. Mm. Nadim, you have a strong opinion about education. I have many strong opinions about education, but I, I just wanted to highlight there was actually no point in disagreement, actually, with what we said. Just because Google isn't the one who's thinking about it doesn't mean that there are other institutions who are not. I mean, I'll give you a good example. Google, even though they cracked search and before Google, there was Yahoo and AltaVista, right? They were the ones who proliferated search. Google came out and figured out what is the best user experience and what is the best ranking system to be able to do that. But then you would also think that Larry and Sergey would be like, well, if we can do this for text, why can't we do this for video? They didn't invent YouTube. They bought YouTube right? But you would have thought that they would have been the ones who were thinking about this. Even in other industries, when you were thinking about medical devices and applying AI to some of these things, my perspective is the reason why m most private enterprises are thinking about these industries is because it's private to private sector. So it's easier to sell. It's easier to adopt. Have you tried selling anything to schools or getting schools to adopt anything? It's very difficult. I have. I've had to go to Bhutan to find the least friction point because they desperately need it versus you try serving anybody in the North American system, it's very, very tough, even in the European system. So from a strictly practical perspective, I think that's why. I think part of what we can do to help proliferate some of these things within the quote unquote system, and by the way, my perspective is I think direct to learner to start is probably better. So mm -hmm. just like what you said about your son, why would we have to wait for systems to be able to adopt them such that people can use them. They have a device, they have internet. Why should we have some of these barriers? And then I think there should be parental tools for moderation, just like we have for YouTube and some of these other apps. So a lot of these things aren't necessarily a secret for how to do them. We have answers for them. But then once we figure out how to put them, put these tools in an environment where they can be a little bit more structured and collaborative, whatever, I think it's up, up to education institutions and leadership to figure out how we can be less combative. So for example, ChatGPT comes out, shut down ChatGPT mm -hmm. versus how can we take a five-year time horizon view of how we can integrate these tools to improve learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. What's crazy is maybe you have different um, experiences with this. I've met with tons of schools, tons of leadership, all that stuff. No one has ever taken that perspective of in a five-year time horizon, how can we use these tools to improve learning, out mm -hmm. learning outcomes? And to me, that's a little disappointing. Luca? I, I'm just reflecting on a, a bit of the language that we're using because I, I clearly I'm I'm an avid problem solver. I love to solve problems, but before I do that, I want to find the right problem. And so I think this this kind of rush to get to let's solve this problem. I think we really want to sit carefully. And you know, one of my favorite quotes is of course Einstein, the lawyer. But you know, if, if you had an hour to solve a problem, you'd spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes proposing the solution. And I think what we find ourselves in right now in this peak of the hype cycle is that everything's a solution. Here's the solution. And you know, we work directly with you know, hundreds of schools. And what we find from them, of course, is you know, they are so overwhelmed. Um, but of course, I think one thing we should remember is that we're actually operating in human systems. Mm -hmm. And so as much as we might love the technology, and I have to say, I'm a, bit of a, I'm a massive nerd. I love tech, you know. Um, I love exploring like the latest and the kind of bleeding edge, the cutting edge. But I think what we've missed here is that we are operating in the human system. Mm -hmm. And so direct to, mo direct to learner model, I absolutely think it's a fantastic part of the mix. But what's the, I, what, I, what I struggle with is how individualistic that becomes mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, schools post-COVID are more important than ever before because they are places of belonging. Exactly. They are places where young people get back just to be next to another human being, to be playful together. And I think the big transformation needed is to finally sever our connection to the industrial paradigm and the efficiency paradigm as well, I think, that is too narrowly driving an employability notion. So I'd um, love, love a conversation on this point, you know, we have a beautiful diversity in our human expression. And education for me is the drawing out of your unique essence and your quality 
so that you can contribute powerfully to a marketplace and powerfully to a community. And so that's what, that's what AI can unlock in us, all these different tools. It means all we really need to do at the base level as first principle is cultivate deep curiosity. And guess what? That is an innate feature of a human being. And somehow the existing systems, well, what they do is if it crushes, you know, curiosity, not only in the learners, but also in the educators that are working so hard to try to provide a personalized experience to 30 learners in front of them every single day, which by the way, I can tell you categorically is not possible to do. You cannot differentiate at that level unless we start to utilize and spin up some of these technologies that will augment the capacity of a teacher, not to be an instructor anymore, but to be a learning architect, to be a learning guide, to curate an experience and not one that's just cognitive. And this is a really important point I want, I want us to focus on. It's a social process. Learning's a social process. Cohort-based learning is always more powerful. And I'm sure you would have seen at TKS and in Stanford, right? The reason we bring people together is because there's the shared cognition taking place. And then of course, how do we you know, um, regulate our emotional tone as we do all this work as well as human beings? We cannot think our way out of this moment. We have to feel, we have to connect, and we have to imagine, reimagine our way forward, I think. Isabel, how should we reimagine it? Yes, yeah, so I could not agree more um, with Luca on the importance of social brains um, and social connections, which is one of the uh, big concerns actually right now with, um, with those AI tools that are emerging. Um, when we think about personalized learning, this vision of having isolated learners that have potentially greater mental health issues than they do have today, very concerning. Um, so I love the work that we are embarking on at Stanford about thinking about how can we leverage AI for collaborations, for small group instructions, um, where um, AI can actually facilitate those with that, that type of instruction uh, in a way that we could not do it before. Zoya Ansari, a student in Paris, uh, France, studying international governance and diplomacy centers. She's also a Doha Debates ambassador. Correct. And she's, she's asking, as artificial intelligence reshapes education, we must also acknowledge that AI models often reflect existing gender biases and may inadvertently exclude certain social groups. What collaborative me measures do you propose to ensure that AI technologies do not incorporate the human bias of the data sets it is trained on, which is our data that we fed it with uh, all our biases and uh, our different truth as well, and enhances education for everyone, irrespective of gender or social background. Who wants to answer? Yeah, so we, ha we have looked very closely at biases. Um, so some of my researchers have um, uh, I've looked at uh, multiple areas of biases. Gender, I'm not sure, but certainly um, multilingual um, learners, for example, there's huge bias uh, against non-English uh, non speakers. And I can see this myself every day as a non-native English speaker using all these tools. Very, I can see the bias, very, very obvious. Um, uh, so biases exist. Now, where I'm very hopeful is um, in this new wave of AI that we are seeing with um, all these um, new apps that are built on top of uh, ChatGPT type. Uh, we are seeing more and more models that are um, built for specific populations. So we are building, for example, a Stanford one on the Black Rhetoric Corpus, those so specific language models that are taking into account specific population groups. So I'm hopeful that over time, uh, more and more will will um, thrive uh, to combat uh, biases, which absolutely exist. I think we all agree on the values. That's what we were saying before we start the podcast. So we agree on the values. We agree that we want uh, humanity to prevail, that we want ethics to prevail, but we disagree on the how. Can I quickly add just another perspective to the to your answer? So. There's one approach of how can you build applications for certain communities? And then there's the, how are we collecting more data from a lot of these different people? But I actually think technology could play a big role in solving this problem. So how AI is trained right now is you need very large data sets, mm. right? And you need to train, so this is the whole idea of big data, right? And you need to train the, the better and the more, so higher quality data and the more data you have, you'll have better outcomes, right? So it's like the opposite of garbage in, garbage out, right? Good in, good out. But humans don't learn this way, right? Humans don't need a thousand data points to know not to touch a stove, right? Whereas in a reinforcement learning algorithm, you need a bunch of these. 
So this is a new tech, it's not a new technology, but it's this concept that's coming out, which is not big data, but small data and not large language models, but small language models. Yeah. So even if you had smaller data sets and smaller populations, you're still be able to run inference, which is the t technical AI term when you're actually applying the machine learning algorithms. You're still able to do that off much smaller populations. That's something I'm very bullish on. That's something I know that's not being talked about as much, but Google and Stanford and all these other like, you know, OpenAI, Mistral, Anthropic, any of these people, they are really, really focusing on because we never want the data to be the limiting factor for having better outcomes for people. So that's something if there are listeners listening to this and they're interested in figuring out or, or diving more into that topic, that could be something interesting as well. For listeners, uh, this is the first time since we started that I have nodding heads from Isabel and look at what <laughs> Nadim is saying. <laughs> Do you care to comment? <laughs> uh, um there's a lot of value in data today. And so one lens I would always apply to that is if you are working with young people under the age of 18, that picks up a whole range of other responsibilities that you uh, that you have as an educational technology company or a tech company more broadly. So I think having a conversation about data sovereignty is really important, data transparency as well. A lot of these are open models, you know, they feed into the model increasingly and that might actually be in contravention of a, a whole range of laws at whatever country that might be happening. So. Because this is moving so quickly, my sense, Rao, is that we can't keep up with it. It's how do we respond to it? How do we think really proactively about that? Absolutely. Like the data set is important. This is why we have such an... I'm glad you brought up the linguistic bias. Because, well. you know, it is. You know, the, I think what's, it's going to steamroll over some of the beautiful diversity that exists within our human communities, right? Or even in our, our communities more broadly than that, if we think about biodiversity. Um, the other thing I just want to make a point on is that technology, like all technology, um, like... It should enable us to be more connected and more human. I know that's easy to say, but the other piece we need to bring to this is the more time we spend on screens, we probably need to spend more time in nature. And, you know, again, you can look at attentional restoration theory, you can look at a whole range of other things. Like, I don't think what we want to do is effectively just be neurolinked up into, you know, in a transhumanist way. We actually want to make sure that we are living in a very connected way with our local ecology. That, to me, seems to be a really important lens that we cannot forget. Your, the closing remark with you. Yeah, no, I love what uh, both Nadim and Luca mentioned. Uh, actually, I have a lot of agreement. I love the vision of um, um, a future wor world of learning as opposed as opposed to strictly education. Um, you know, this is what we are working on at the Stanford Accelerator for learning and not the mm -hmm. Stanford Accelerator for education. So I love that vision. Uh, technology is a tool, um, although it's called artificial intelligence. It was built by Humans. Us, uh, humans. Uh, and so it's in our hands to uh, forge this better, brighter future of learning. When you talk about Stanford working on AI since years, when you talk about uh, thinking education in Australia and uh, Nadim everywhere around the world, uh, including Bhutan, we also think that there are still people studying at school under a tree. We still have university that don't have uh, seats for their students. So, And when we come to the data, there's data poverty. There are people who actually don't have access to all these democratized uh, tools. They don't have enough data to, act uh, to actually connect and learn from everything that is sometimes made accessible, whether uh, with subscription or for free. So let's focus on the digital divide. You all mentioned this one way or another in your opinion positions. And for our viewers and listeners at home, a reminder that the phrase digital divide refers to the unequal access to digital technology, things like internet networks, as I mentioned, smartphones and computers. The importance of those technologies in the modern world means that those who don't have access to them are disadvantaged in many ways, impacting work, education, many other parts of life, definitely their future. So Nadim, you are a big advocate of this AI and how can we make it accessible? So there's actually good news to this question. Because if we take a step back, when the internet was, inter internet was pro proliferating and even mobile, there was a massive divide because infrastructure was a huge problem, right? You, ha you had to have power lines and internet lines to be able to transmit the information. And then with Wi-Fi and data, so on and so forth, even with mobile, hardware is very expensive. So someone had to make mobile cheaper. And this is where Nokia and Motorola came in. So if you look in, you know, 
the the global south or even for the bottom billion actually mobile penetration now is pretty high compared to where it was 10 years ago still not fancy smartphones or anything but nokia mobile or motorola whatever so today when we're talking about ai specifically being able to be more proliferated i actually don't think that there's a massive infrastructure gap that exists anymore and if there are I'm pretty optimistic in the next five years, we'll be able to sort that out. So for example, with solutions like Starlink, not only Starlink, but with solutions like, like Starlink, well, now we should be able to cover the world with internet access and then with very cheap mobile technology. But most people what, should. what would be their incentive for uh, for-profit businesses uh, to make it accessible? I mean, I just went back to the Google and Facebook example, right? The only way more people can search on Google as an example is just, let's use ChatGPT. Say ChatGPT becomes the next search engine, right? Mm -hmm. That means for every search and say there's advertisements or whatever the case it is, but for more users they have on the platform, the more money that they make. And it, especially when you're looking at emerging markets in the next 10 years, being, uh, you know, GDP rising, consumption rising, all those things, there's a massive incentive actually, right? When you look at global GDP growth as a percentage, it's not... North America. Mm -hmm. It's you know, countries in Africa, it's India, it's Indonesia, it's China, it's all these places. So I actually do think there's a massive inherent incentive to focus on those markets as well. Isabel doesn't seem to agree with you. Yeah, I um I think that on on this question of digital divide, um there are there are multiple layers. So there are some there is some hope, and I actually agree with Nadine. There are there are some good news um, uh, if you look at the evolution and the penetration of devices. Um, the other good news on uh, AI is that so far the early research suggests that um, across a lot of different topics, including writing, creativity, different types of performance, uh, AI actually benefits the most the underperformers. Mm. So it's actually an equalizer. Um, so that's really good news. Mm. Now, my concern over time uh, on education is uh, even beyond the digital divide is that we're creating another form of divide. I could see a world in the future where effectively we say AI tutors are great for all these poor kids. Mm. And then those more privileged families were going to use those very expensive human tutors. And as a matter of fact, this is what existed not that long ago. Uh, well, well, of families used to have these very expensive uh, tutors that uh, that families still use today, but were very prevalent several several decades ago. So anyway, that's my concern: is that we may actually see a world where we are creating another form of divide uh, beyond the digital divide. Wow, that's a lot of provoking thought. Luca, I didn't think about it at all before. You you opened my eyes to to a big big thing to think about. I think the again, my question is always in order to do what? So if we serve we do okay, let's solve the digital divide. But are are we running faster to the wrong destination? And I think all we need to do is look at our, our how we're tracking against the sustainable development goals, which will expire in twenty thirty, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um at, at the UNGA, you know, it's very clear that we are not on track. And so my sense is it just can't be more of the same. It can't be more of the accelerated into, it can't be more of an improvement paradigm or just like a basic reform or programmatic paradigm. We need real transformation at a deeper level. And that's not just new technology. That's not solving the digital divide in terms of technology. It's also shifting maybe what you might call the philosophical divide, which is to say, you know, like the human side, like, of learning, of schools, of community, of existence itself. I mean, that's why we all get out, is, is to be connected, to be in service of something greater than ourselves. This is a purpose motive. And I mean, we have, all, we have the meta crisis happening right now, as it's called, right? All these converging challenges. And there's a motivation epidemic for anyone that's listening, that's working in a school. You can see this taking place. I think to Nadim's point, largely because it's not going to be sufficient to, to say, oh, we're just gonna roll out the same, same old thing as a system. You know, learners can directly go to these new tools. And so, but my sense is we need to have a, a transformed view. We need to reimagine the purpose of what education is for. And that has to be for true multidimensional human flourishing. And so that means rather than saying, okay, we're just going to augment cognition and now we're going to test you more, right? That's, that's perfect. That's great because we can become more efficient. We can accelerate learning. But in order to do what? Surely it's to be able to thrive at work, at home, in life. And so that's why I think a huge, I'm a huge proponent 
for bringing in the social, the emotional, and the cognitive and bringing them together as a Venn diagram, just as we must also, dear friends, think about education, ecology, and economics. We can't solve for this education challenge without thinking about the incredible bifurcation in the economic space, where we've seen an in- we're at the most unequal point in human history. You now, when we look at capital, and of course, post-COVID, the, the ultra-wealthy did incredibly well out of COVID. And so this is the whole idea, you know? Like, so so here, here's my question. Yeah. 100% agree with everything you said. 110%, okay? And by the way... Stop the debate then. It, <laughs> no, no, I'm waiting no, for the rest of it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This, this AI revolution yeah. wasn't the forcing function. Like you, two years ago, you could have said the exact same thing. 100%. Five years ago, you could, you could oh, have said the exact same thing. Exactly. Challenge. So if we're saying in 100 years, so what you're saying, you're, you're saying the thing that most people, I think, over the age of 25 who've gone through an age, education system know... And we're like, why isn't this happening? So I would, I would posit to you, yeah. it's like, yes, let's do all the things that you're saying. How? Which is why if we could do it through the education system, hopefully we would have or someone would have or schools yeah. or departments or yeah. something, which is why I'm so bullish on direct to learner. Yeah. Although that, at that, you're making, the, you're making the, I think there is an implicit assumption be, behind what you're saying, which is that... Um, Right now, I see AI as um, possibly really improving education systems and making if we were, it's really opening new possibilities um, of having learners within education systems really be more in charge of their own learning. And so um, you're making the, the assumption, I think, that only direct to learners does that in, so, to some extent. So. I, I, I think that the education system can also benefit from those new technologies let me, to let me ask really you. build some richer learning environments. Let me ask you a question. How do most young people learn how to code now? Uh, you may have data on this. I don't have the data on top of my head, but I see, you know, I supported Code.org. Code, Code.org has done a fabulous job at um, uh, bringing computer science for all in every school straight in the United States and now global. Kids are not learning how to code in school. It's just fact. It's not true. Even financial literacy. Where do kids learn financial literacy? Yes. It, it, it's just, like, we can say it. It's just not true. So, when, and when we look back at all of these other things that we want people to learn, hopefully, and by the way, I'm with you guys. I want to be optimistic. I want to figure out a way where we can figure out how to embed them. Yeah. So this specific question, let me take a step back, is just about direct learning to figuring out how to reimagine the education system. Everyone here at this conference wants to reimagine the education system. Yeah. Everyone here wants not to have an education system, which foundation was built to create but, factory workers, but right? But everyone here also has wor- worries about AI. I mean, uh, I see that Luca and, uh, and Isabel are actually agreeing with you. There is a difference exactly. between learning and education. We're, we're and trying hard to disagree. <laughs> Let's be clear. Let's be clear. <laughs> but, Luca. Um, uh, look, I, I just think... My question is, okay, where where are young people learning to code? That's one question. My other question is, where are young people learning to care? Mm. And I think this is this is the real promise. And I am an optimist, but I'm an action based optimist because mm. there's no point just holding a rosy vision of the future and doing nothing about it. It's like, how are we called to act? How do we become different? If we expect our systems to transform, we must also be transforming simultaneously. Mm. We must be allowing the old practices, the old ways of being, the old ways of doing to die mm-hmm. so that new ways of being and doing can be born. This is ultimately the entrepreneurial mindset anyway. You see something that's creative destruction and you move forward. So my sense is, hopefully, what we can do is direct to learner, whenever there's any direct instruction, whenever there's any uh, deliberate practice required, that should be all the realm of cognitive augmentation of AI. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel Ho, the executive director of the Stanford Accelerator for Learning, not Education. Nadim Natu, the founder of the Knowledge Society, and Luca Pari, the CEO and founder of the Learning Free Future. Thanks to our global listeners, Zoya Ansari in France. And thanks to you for listening to this episode of the Doha Debates podcast. Follow us on our social media where we try to connect, really connect, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. Also at DohaDebates.com, you can find lesson plans and learning materials on this topic and all our debates topic. That's at DohaDebates.com. Stay safe and stay well and stay connected.